Um, so welcome to the Skagit Valley and Whidbey NMRA Clinic. We're sponsored by the Pacific Northwest Region, fourth division of the NMRA. Um, <clears throat> tonight's presentation, we have Rich Tom. He's going to be talking about uh, his rubber rock technique that he recently discovered to uh, add scenery to his Coldwater Creek and Cascade Railroad, which is a HO scale uh, railroad located out in the fine foothills of Coopville. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a, I've, I've seen it from almost from the beginning and to where it is now. And he's done a lot of work to it over the years. It's a small railroad, but it's very finely detailed. And uh, after operating on it a couple times, it's very fun to operate on. So if you ever get a chance to come out here someday after COVID, um, especially during um, sound rail events. Um, his layout's usually open during that time for operating sessions, so highly recommended. But uh, this uh, rubber rock technique is something different, I think. I haven't, I had never seen it before until Rich had shown it um, previously. So it should be very interesting. And with that, I've already made you a host, Rich, so you should be ready to share screen and, and get going. Okay, for those of you, I've met a lot of you uh, folks out there, but a lot of you I haven't. So I'm Rich Tom, live up here in the isolation of Whidbey Island, about midway, a few miles south of Coopville. And uh, I started building this layout around 2009, uh, plus or minus. And uh, I got interested in these rubber rocks. So that's the subject. Um, and the question is, is it a better alternative than the, the classic uh, plaster rosin ones, or is it at least another one? So we'll talk about that. To uh, understand why I uh, wanted to use them or try them, you need to know a little bit about the railroad itself. Uh, it's called the Cold Water Creek and Cascade. It's HO scale standard. It's based uh, in the Puget Sound region in 1928. It's a freelance chart line with connections with NP and GN. Uh, it originally started uh, in the mineral industry and the mine sort of played out. Uh, and then it, fo it then focused on uh, timber and the GN finally bought it. So Coldwater Creek is now a GN uh, uh, owned line. Uh, timber, lumber, minerals, general merchandise. And it's located in a spare bedroom, uh, an odd size. It's not rectangular. It has one uh, wall and an angle, which has caused some problems. And the layout itself is about 16 by 12 by 11. Uh, there's an overall view, as you see it when you enter the train room. Um, it is, uh, this is the 16 foot. Uh, if you can see my mouse moving there, I'm not sure if you can or not, along this dimension, 12 feet this way, and there's 11 feet in this direction. Uh, it's not uh, multi-level in the classic sense, although, as you can see, there are three levels. And uh, I had, at about this time, met Al Frash, who many of you might remember, who had a quite a spectacular N-scale layout in Freeland. And I began operating on it and uh, had considered, well, I, I had such a small space. Why not make it uh, double level, true double level with a helix? And the room was just so small, and the only place I could have put the helix was back here in this far corner. And you can't scenic a helix in any way. It would, just, would have been this big, ugly box. So I abandoned that and just uh, got as many levels uh, on the layout as possible, just using steady gradients and, and no helix. You can't see much from uh, on the, the track diagram. I won't go over it in detail other than this is the 16 foot direction along the long side. There are three levels in the green is a level one. Uh, in the uh, yellow is a yellow two. And the brown is a yellow three. 
the maximum separation is about 10 inches. Uh, in the, in this smaller in this smaller room, uh, I was still able to get an, a, a main line 82 feet long, and there's a branch line that comes off and runs behind scenery over to Alpine. That's another 20 feet. So there is a fair amount of operation in a relatively small space. This is the um, long end of the layout, and all these rocks which are the subject of the talk tonight are so-called rubber rocks. Cliff Aker and I were talking about bridges earlier. I just finished this one, had nothing else to do during the, the, the lockdown. So built this uh, bridge here. And uh, as many of you have discovered when you build these trestles, you say, oh, I'll finish this off in two weeks. It was like three months building this thing, uh, but uh, there it is. Anyway, the layout was designed for operations from the start. The guest crew size is four. I've had as many as five and it works well. And it takes about three to run it. Uh, we use written crew orders and handwritten switch lists, uh, no cards. There just aren't enough uh, cars to move to make that uh, necessary. And I had uh, 18 full up op sessions uh, through February when everything stopped. I was signed up again for Sound Rail. And unfortunately, we had to cancel Sound Rail in, in March because that was the very uh, beginning of the of COVID. It's Ditch Tracks DCC, and all the locomotives have sound. And typical op session uh, here are some people you may know. This is Joe Green and Ron Aletti from SQUIM over on the peninsula, Rich Blake and John Wilbert. And uh, I didn't take this photo intentionally. It doesn't always work this way when you have two guys over here and two guys over here. Sometimes you have four guys here and four guys there. Uh, uh, you people who are into operations, you know what I'm talking about. And an overall view of the long side of the layout with Silver Falls in the foreground, and then the north end of the layout at Cascade. So with that introduction, let's get into scenic. Uh, pretty typical uh, construction technique, nothing fancy, uh, standard cookie cut cutter construction. Uh, with risers, L girders, nothing unusual there. And I began operating in this early stage, uh, being advised by friends, and it was a good thing to do. You really need to do this before you start building scenery. Worked out well. One unusual feature, uh, not unusual, it's not as common as uh, other people use, is um, I used uh, brown paper as the base for my hard shell. Here are the two Al's, we used to call them Al number one, Al Frash, who's now a resident of Tucson, and Al Carter. This is one of the first op sessions way back, I don't know, 2010, probably at least 10 years ago. Anyway, this hard shell technique, uh, I didn't uh, think it up. Uh, I saw it in Model Railroader about 15 years ago. And it was intriguing um, uh, for a couple of reasons. You basically hot glue it over framework of, uh, I use mostly plywood uh, or cardboard strips. And one advantage to it, well, there's several. One is you get sort of an interesting texture, as you can see here. Now, many of these steep areas will get covered by rock work, but many of them also won't. So uh, I found this a little more intriguing uh, than just uh, paper towels over plaster cloth uh, over cardboard strips and that you have this texture, uh, which I found interesting. The, the other advantage, another advantage is that you can repair it or change it very easily. You just uh, cut it out with a, a number 11 blade, works pretty well. Well, the next step uh, is pretty uh, common. You'd have to put down plaster cloth, but uh, if you put it directly over brown paper, you get a mess. 
So you have to uh, prime the uh, paper with something. The trains article that I read recommended some sort of oil-based primer, which so I used that. I'm not sure you need to use oil-based. I think it could be latex just as well. But whatever you do, you have to put something to stiffen up and make waterproof that brown paper before you add your plaster cloth. One advantage to this is you can uh, get by with a single layer of plaster cloth because the brown paper uh, underneath uh, has is pretty stiff on its own. You put the two together and it's it's pretty firm. So here's the result uh, with the plaster cloth over the construct the brown paper. Uh, I use construction paper. You can get rolls of it in the Home Depot or you can cut up grocery bags if you like. It's the same stuff. And uh, a couple of the issues that I had that, that lent to rubber rocks or leaded, led to rubber rocks. So I had two lift outs. There's this one here and this large one back here on White Mountain. Now, they're not lift outs in the sense that during a session that you have to lift them out. Um, but you had to, they were so large, you had to, I had to lift them in at least once. So I was concerned about the weight of this lift out and this lift out uh, in that it had to be sort of manhandled in there. This white mountain is about eight foot off the floor. So that was, that is one thing that led me to consider rubber rocks is the weight of uh, the, the rock outcroppings itself, uh, themselves. Here's a closer look at that lift out. And uh, it turns out there are four track levels under that lift out. I won't go over them in detail. There's a couple of uh, staging tracks. There's the, the branch line to Alpine, and there's a main line, and uh, what have you. And there are a couple of turnouts. So it was important to be able to get in there. And uh, I, uh, to solve that problem, I made White Mountain almost stretch to the ceiling. So it was tall enough, it is tall enough, so that I can get in there, stand up fully upright, and uh, do uh, work in here if necessary. If I really have to do something serious like repair track work or replace a turnout, I can then get that lift out out, out uh, uh, to, to do that work. But uh, since the lift out went in around 2012 or so, I haven't had it out since. So the challenges of this white mountain that I've just talked about, uh, there are more lift outs back here. Uh, there are several track, there are three track levels back here behind these lift out sections. So all of those, uh, I uh, said, I think I'll try these rubber rocks to make them lightweight. That was the whole motivation. So sort of in words, weight, that large lift out especially. Um, oh, it's a small layout. I have 20 inch, 20 inch curves in many places. Uh, I needed uh, some means of making outcroppings that could conform to 20 inch curves. And I made like almost every does, uh, everyone does a lot of mistakes. I uh, crammed too much railroad in a small space. It, uh, the track plan looks like a spaghetti bowl, but most people have made favorable comments that the way it's scenic and the way that the, the way the track levels are isolated from each other it really doesn't look like a spaghetti bowl. Uh, I built a one to six card stock, card stock model, trying to figure out uh, the different levels. And even with building that model, I didn't leave enough space uh, for rocks between the different track levels, which uh, is probably a common mistake. In any, in any case, I made it. And all that put together, told me, well, plaster castings seem sort of difficult, so let's look into rubber rocks. So I tried, uh, there are several people who make these things, and I uh, homed in on Cripple Bush Valley models. 
Uh, they're out east somewhere. And they have a wide variety of uh, types of rocks, uh, limestone, uh, granite, uh, basalt. Um, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of those uh, a little bit later. Uh, and that's what I went with. What is rubber rock? Well, it's not a mold, it's a positive. You attach it directly to your hard shell. It's a replica and rubber of an outcropping uh, ready to, to glue down. And it's made with a technique that's uh, the same one that is used to make Halloween masks. And the material, uh, when you pick one of these rubber rocks up, feels very much like a, a, a Halloween mask of uh, Trump or Biden, take your pick. So uh, what do you get? Uh, this is what you get. This is a particular one called Blocky Rock, which I'll talk about a bit. Uh, this is on my kitchen counter and these squares are six inches uh, square. So it sort of gives you an idea of how, how large these can be. Some are, some are quite a bit smaller, but this is about as large as they come. And when you take it out of the package, this is what you see. It's a pretty amazing detail. I don't know how it compares to a, a well done uh, casting. Uh, one advantage to castings is that these are very sturdy. Uh, you can hit this thing with a screwdriver or a, a putty knife and you can't damage it. Uh, if you do that with other kinds of uh, rock outcroppings, you certainly will damage it. So one advantage is sturdiness uh, after it's installed on the layout. The relief is, uh, and the relief varies quite a bit between the castings that they offer. It is very impressive. Uh, what's the backside look like? Uh, you have to think about this because you're going to, you have to glue this down to the layout somehow the hard shell. And here's the, the relief you can see on the back side. This has relief up to maybe one inch depth. But there's also a, a fair amount of scrap involved. There's this uh, rim around the edge of the uh, rock outcrop that you'll want to deal with. This one I had al already taken some chunks off the end. So um, I had uh, this, it was a little bit longer than this. I've already attacked this particular piece. The other thing uh, that's important is these are flexible. Uh, this is one of the less flexible uh, patterns because of the relief. The more, the deeper relief, the you get a, an egg carton effect uh, and you can't bend it very well. In fact, uh, one of the castings, uh, the rubber rocks, I should say, I used, uh, the relief was so deep, I couldn't, I could barely bend it. So you have to be careful there about which ones you buy. But they, the flexibility is a big deal here. So how do you start to use these things? Um, we'll talk about sizing them and attaching them and then adding your top ground layer. I'll use the White Mountain lift out to demonstrate it. Here's the, that lift out that's on a, a workbench uh, in the layout room. Uh, I built it, of course, off the layout. And I've put the brown paper over the, the plywood frame. This has a very uh, stiff plywood frame. Uh, then the brown paper goes on, uh, hot glued, as I mentioned, and then the uh, single layer of plaster cloth. And then uh, uh, I took a, uh, a marking pen and just started marking out where my outcroppings wanted to be. There's going to be a large one here and then a large one here. And obviously, when you build the hard shell underneath, you want to design the areas where you're going to put these uh, outcroppings. Uh, and then uh, where you want to shelf, often the, these uh, will be filled with talus below the, the, the steeper outcroppings. And you mark those on the hard shell too. Uh, the next thing uh, I, I did and uh, you would do is take some 
tissue paper and uh, pin it onto the hard shell and trace that future ro rock outcropping on it with a marking pen. Uh, a feature of the rubber rocks that you can do with other kinds of rocks too is you can make very small ones uh, that you wouldn't necessarily think of. You wouldn't think of taking a mold and perhaps making a rock outcropping that small. It's very easy with the rubber rocks. So here's the other face of the White Mountain lift out sitting on a card table in the layout room. Uh, this has a number of rock outcroppings on them. And of course, you number them uh, to keep them straight once you transfer them to uh, the rocks themselves. So basically, this is the pin on tracing paper and copy step. You then uh, cut out or take those pieces of tracing paper and take them over to the workbench and you put them on your rubber rock. Uh, again, you pin it uh, in place. Notice the arrows here uh, pointing up. These uh, rubber rocks do have some obvious directionality. They, they look better uh, either facing upward or upside down than or, or rotated 90 degrees. It's pretty obvious when you take them out of the envelope uh, how they should be oriented. And once you start cutting them into smaller pieces, sometimes you lose that orientation. So uh, I mark on the back of the rubber rocks uh, an upward arrow. So I, I keep that arrow uh, orientation straight. That may come uh, become a little clearer on the next photo or two. And you, you, want, you want to go to save these scrap pieces. Uh, this one over here probably won't be useful. It has an unusual shape. So that just may end up in the garbage can, but this one will certainly be useful enough to use somewhere else on the way out. So here's that lift out again. I've taken the, the rubber rocks uh, that I wanted to use here and I've pinned them uh, onto the hard shell and then I just I leave it for a day and come back the next day and say, does that still look good? Now, that's not something you can easily do with a casting. You probably could, but it's very easy with the rubber rocks. And if you come back the next day, oh, I really don't like that. You can just pull it off and, and start over. Having, uh, you've cut the rubber rock pieces out, now you need to glue them down. And uh, there are several things you can use, all, all kinds of caulk. Um, I didn't use caulk because you, really need to hold these in place until the caulk sets. Uh, some of them, as I mentioned, some of the one the, the rocks with uh, deeper relief, you will have to need some sort of mechanical reinforcing. Um, so rather than stand there and holding uh, a rubber rock in place for 30 minutes to let caulk set up, I use the other principal option, which is hot glue. Uh, as everybody knows, it's really fast grab. Uh, as everyone knows, you can get burned fingers pretty easily because you do have to hold the rocks in place until the hot glue sets up. The worst part of hot glue is the, the strings that you get, which there's nothing you can really do about that. Just pull them off later. And again, you may need mechanical reinforcing if that rubber rock is really um, difficult to keep in place. And here's what I, an example of what I mean. Here's a, a rubber rock that was hot glued down. Um, and I, I had trouble keeping this upper joint in place. So I just poked some toothpicks into it. While the hot glue is setting up, there's a couple more down here. And uh, once the glue is set up, you just uh, snip them off the toothpicks off and, and they disappear once you uh, color the rocks and add texture later. So having your rocks glued in place, now you use your favorite material to fill around them uh, to uh, fill the areas between the rocks. 
Um, all kinds of choices here, structural light, plasters, ground goop. I use sculpt mode, sculpt the mold. That's my favorite. Uh, won't go with any reasons why. It's a lot of people don't like it. Other people love it. I, I am in the latter category. I'm very fond of it. So, okay, having glued them in place, uh, now you have to color them. And this is sort of the main, another main departure from castings. They, these rocks, they don't stain. You really have to paint them in effect. Here's a cut where I've used, um, I showed you a photo of uh, something called blocky rock uh, earlier. And it's one of the castings that uh, Cripple Bush offers that has some nicely uh, squared off features that resembles uh, rock that's been blasted as it would be in a cut. So I used blocky rock in, in the cut areas because it had this uh, appearance of being uh, worked by machinery or by, by hand tools. This is, the, this is the way they look coming out of the, the bag. And I, I, you could probably use them this way without any additional uh, painting. They are painted sort of a battleship gray. Um, and if your layout lighting is very directional, I have track lights. I don't have, uh, uh, I don't have uh, ceiling uh, fixture fluorescence or anything like that. So the, the light is fairly directional. In this case, the track light is more or less above this rock and you get some pretty nice shadows with, without any intentional painting. Uh, in other places where the rocks are lit rather head on, where they're perpendicular to the direction of the light, uh, you really do have to create the illusion of shadows. I mentioned earlier the scrap pieces are useful. Here's just a couple of those scraps that I pointed to earlier that I've cut off and glued down. Uh, again, you can do this with castings, but most people don't take the trouble to uh, make a casting this small, but it's very easy to do with these rubber rocks. The next step is uh, I take uh, gesso, white acrylic gesso. Uh, I dilute it one to one and just paint everything. I paint the ru rubber rocks and I paint the hard shell underneath that has been covered with sculpt mold. So this is sculpt mold up here. Uh, over plaster cloth, over brown paper, and this is the rubber rock right here. I uh, didn't know what I was doing. I bought some artist grade uh, gesso from Dick Blick, but you, you're not creating a Mona Lisa here, so you really don't need a student grade gesso. You can get some cheap stuff. Uh, you don't need uh, something that's going to last 100 years. Uh, any kind of gesso will, will do. And uh, the next step that, that I used anyway is to cover every th the rubber rocks with what I call a basic rock wash. Uh, this is a matter of taste, of course, and it depends on the part of the country you're modeling. I was modeling Western Washington, Puget Sound area. So most of my rock outcroppings are granite. So they're basically gray with streaks of brown. The next step that I used was to create a, a, a brown uh, tone for actually two uh, shades of brown. I used two different mixtures uh, to coat the, uh, the uh, sculpt the mold and then uh, let it uh, dribble down over uh, into the crevices of the rubber rocks. And uh, before I did the painting, I added uh, the talus that is below uh, many, not all, but many of the rock outcroppings so that they receive the stain uh, as well as the, the casting itself. And as usual, you let gravity work for you. Uh, here you can see the brown stain is dribbled very nicely down these rubber rocks and into the talus underneath. 
The next step is to create some rock shadow. And I used an India ink wash to do this. And uh, this, is, this is very similar to how you stain a casting. Um, at least I found, maybe it was just me and, and lack of good technique, I really couldn't get it to do that magic thing of sort of going in and filling all the cracks uh, as they often do uh, with a plaster casting. It was, most, many of the areas had to be painted with a brush. The third and final step is a rock highlight. And uh, this again depends on your layout lighting but uh, the intention here is to uh, replicate uh, the surfaces of the rocks that are directly illuminated by sunlight and therefore would appear brightest. And I just used a lighter shade of gray and I dry brushed it on. Uh, um, this one I think I actually overdid a little bit. So I went back and, and dulled this down, toned it down. This is just a little bit too bright. But the idea is to create rock shadow and rock highlights over the basic coloring of the rock itself. Here's an area, these castings, uh, not castings, I'm using that word again, these rubber rocks uh, are illuminated almost head on by the track lights. So there wasn't uh, any natural shadowing going on. So you really have to uh, paint the, uh, a detail on. And so I did the basic rock, rock color is this basic gray and then the rock shadow color is painted on with India ink and then the highlight color. This uh, lift out which I showed you earlier is uh, now in place. And these are the ones in front of it that I've just been talking about. This one piece of uh, rubber rock, oops, let me go back, was uh, the relief was so deep, I actually had to wire it to the hard shell. I just poked a couple holes here in the middle, got some uh, picture hanging wire and uh, poked it through the holes and twisted it from the back to pull that casting in. So the result is a, is a rock outcropping that's actually very concave. And I sort of like that effect. Um, you don't often see that with a rock outcross, a rock, rock outcropping that's made some other way. You, they generally look sort of plopped onto me. But the one thing I liked about the rubber rocks is you can cre create concave outcroppings. And if you go out in the real world, of course, there are many of those. And here's a, a, a step later where these foreground these, these are the blocky rock pieces um, in the cuttings, and these are granite on the uh, White Mountain lift out. And this is as it looks more or less today with the bridges finished uh, and, and put in place. I'll talk a, a, a little bit about this sort of deep little canyon in here, which uses another type of rubber rock uh, casting. Here's another thing you can do. You can do this with uh, castings too, uh, to get a little bit of distance deception in addition, of course, to making your trees uh, uh, height uh, shorter as they get further away, is uh, I used three rubber rocks here that had a, a, a tighter uh, pattern to them than the foreground. So even though this is only a couple inches from from these rocks, they look like they're further away, uh, a little bit of deception there. Sheer cliff and basalt, um, since my railroad is in the west, uh, I didn't use any of the offerings uh, for other parts of the country, but uh, you can get these rubber rocks in sandstone, limestone, uh, all kinds of uh, other rocks that are you would find in the Midwest or out East. The sheer cliff is one I found most useful. And uh, that little canyon I showed you in the earlier photograph with the bridges installed, this is before the bridges went in, shows an example of what I mean. These are the rubber rocks. The sheer cliff is very, 
very thin and has very low relief. It's only about an eighth of an inch thick. You can see the thickness of the of the rubber rock itself. And, and it, you can bend it into very sharp curves as I've done here. This is one piece of rubber rock here and over here and back into the canyon. Um, I, I'm sure an expert with castings might be able to do this, but it was very easy to do with these rubber rocks. Here's another view, a little tighter view in this small river course. This sheer cliff pattern was uh, also useful in other tight spots here, two retaining walls uh, that, that have been roughed in and a little piece of outcropping that uh, was to appear there. And this was particularly useful. This is the uh, uh, 12 foot side of the, the railroad. The, this is where uh, the branch takes off, the Alpine branch takes off the switch and it disappears into this tunnel. I wanted to hide this tunnel portal from view. Uh, this is a view that an operator doesn't see. You have to stretch to take this photograph. Normally this tunnel portal is hidden. So I needed to treat this uh, sheer wall up here somehow and this sheer cliff was thin enough that I could bend it and uh, cut it uh, as well as this piece over here. So it was a big advantage to uh, scenic this part of the layout. Another example where it's useful, here's another tunnel portal over a little sharp tunnel. Again, this is this thin, low relief shear cliff pattern. Basalt, um, I tried on uh, above the uh, mountain above Silver Falls. All these patterns are basalt. Uh, I'm not a geologist, but in nature, you generally find basalt in Washington um, and elsewhere, uh, usually in areas uh, by itself. You don't find a, a rock a outcropping of basalt, one of granite, and then 100 feet away, another one of basalt. They're generally uh, dispersed from each other. Uh, so this is where I tried the basalt. It worked out fairly well, a different rock pattern. So here's the finished product uh, before the bridges went in of the White Mountain area. Talking a little bit about trees, this is uh, more related to the hard shell. I mentioned earlier that I used brown paper and one layer of plaster cloth. It's nice and light, uh, it repairs easily, but it's, it's a devil to get trees into. And you folks out there that use foam for scenery, you're lucky, you just poke your toothpick trees into the foam and you're done. But with hard shell, uh, it's a little trickier. Uh, to get the perspective, of course, I used uh, uh, small trees in the, the very top of the mountain, uh, four to six inch trees closer. And then I use Coastman's trees uh, for the large uh, fir trees. I call these background trees because they're in back of all the, the tracks and hopefully in no danger of being knocked over. Foreground trees uh, are the ones where they are in, at some risk of knocking over and damaging because people occasionally have to reach back here. This is a log load track that goes back to this log load. So I treated those differently. Uh, toothpicks don't work. I've never had any success with them because you have to hold the tree in place while the glue dries. So I tried some various methods, uh, including various uh, pieces of copper wire to plant in the hard shell before I glued down my tree. And the simplest one turned out just to be a simple Z bed in uh, copper wire glued in like that. And the idea here is uh, this is what's going to hold your fir tree in place, or any kind of tree, not necessarily your fir, um, in place uh, while the glue dries, giving you some ability to adjust it for uh, true vertical. 
So it's pretty simple. You, having put that copper wire in place, you drill a hole in the trunk, you apply some glue to the wire in the planting area, and you slip the tree under the wire. And while this glue sets up, uh, you can tweak uh, that this fir tree uh, perfectly, uh, which I, I just can't do with a toothpick. Some people may be able to do this, but I was not able to do it. So what I did was use these pieces of copper wire uh, as a, a means of holding the tree vertical while the glue dries. Uh, that's explained here. The flexible wire isn't really holding a tree. It, it holds it to some extent. It just allows you to tweak it uh, left to right or back to front. Uh, while the, the glue dries. I use Aileen's fast grab glue, but you can use your own favorite. So that's what I use for the background trees. For the foreground trees, I planted them on magnets. Uh, this is not an original idea. Uh, I mentioned Al Frash earlier. He had, uh, on his layout, he had put all of his color light signals on magnets because people were forever knocking them over. Uh, and I feared that the same might happen with these foreground trees, so I just planted them on magnets. They have not, uh, the, you're obviously going to obscure these magnets with some sort of foliage. I hadn't done that yet here, just to show the method. So you get some super magnets. So these are about uh, three eighths uh, in diameter and glue them to the bottom of the tree. And then you need something, you need something steel or iron in the hard shell for them to uh, attract to. I used a 14 by three quarter flathead screw. It's just screwed into the hard shell with epoxy on the threads. And that works extremely well. And, the, uh, and that provides the magnet for the base. You do have to brace the trunk uh, while this uh, glue dries down here. So I just use something simple show, shown here. And now these trees, uh, which are not inexpensive, either if, if you buy them in kit form or already built form, they're fairly costly. Uh, beautiful trees, by the way. I just love Coastman's trees. Uh, if somebody bumps into these, uh, they just pop right over. So to sum up, here's the other end of the layout that I didn't talk about very much. Uh, this is Alpine over here. Uh, so what are the advantages, at least in my experience? Uh, they're flexible. And as I pointed out, some are more flexible than others. Um, some of the ones that with very thick relief are not flexible uh, at all, and you have to reinforce them when you glue them down. They're lightweight for sure. Are they less mess? Well, I think so. Uh, not, not that this isn't a big deal. Not that much less mess, but uh, somewhat. They're faster to attach. They attach the hard shell in minutes. You can uh, cut them to size with household scissors. Uh, more advantages, they're reworkable. You can remove them without breakage. If you don't like in, you can easily just pry it out with a, a chisel uh, and start over. You can, you can recolor them if you don't like the first results. You don't have to throw them away. They're dur durable. Uh, fine detail won't chip off. And uh, as I pointed out, scrap pieces uh, make fine small lot crops and, and boulders very, very easily. Disadvantages. Uh, Non-porous surface, they are very different to color than plaster castings. I think they're harder. Uh, I've done a fair amount of plaster castings in the past and they just seem to take stain so much easier. These, you, these are really more like uh, paintings. You really have to paint uh, the shadow detail and highlight detail on as opposed to uh, just touching it with a, uh, a, a bit of uh, India ink wash and, and watch that uh, uh, do its magic. Uh, this is a big deal. 
their cost. Uh, they're about $25 per square foot. So uh, if you have a thousand foot square foot layout, you may want to think twice about using these. My, my layout is very small, it's, it's 16 by 12 by 11. And altogether, the, uh, I spent about $350 on these rubber rocks. And uh, that's, you know, that's the price of a single HO locomotive or a Shea or something. So if you think of it that way, you're not spending a fortune. But uh, if you're doing a, a huge club layout or a, a, some monster layout, cost is definitely a factor. Uh, so very roughly, and I just checked their website a few days ago, uh, since, I, since I bought them, um, uh, they're still roughly about 25 per square foot. They come in all kinds of sizes from maybe as small as six by eight inches to that large piece I showed you at the beginning, uh, uh, maybe uh, 16 inch by uh, 12. Uh, but if you uh, do the math, it's roughly about $25 per square foot. And a, a very final thought is, uh, I, I'm not exactly sure uh, how they make these masks, but apparently the masters, which is a piece of rock itself, uh, wear out after a while. So uh, many of the pieces go out of production. So if you bought a certain pattern that you liked and want to get another piece of it a year later, it may be gone. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want all your rocks to look alike anyway, although if you put them 20 feet apart, nobody notices. But um, I did find that an earlier piece uh, of granite that I particularly liked, I wanted to get another one and put it uh, 10 feet away in another section layout. When I went back to buy a second one, it was uh, no longer uh, in production. So that's it, uh, folks. Uh, that's my experiences with uh, rubber rocks. Uh, anybody have any questions? Well, I can uh, add a comment. Your concave hillside is probably a historic landslide. And so you might want your geotech to look that over. <laughs> Rich, what did you say the company was that uh, you used? There are a few companies out there. Uh, I, I use this one called Cripplebush Valley Models. Here's their website. It's just cripplebush.net. They're out east somewhere. I think it's a single man shop uh, or maybe a couple of guys. So Rich, are you using the um, sculpt mold to blend some of the seams together with your, with your ground cover? The ground cover is sculpt mold. Wherever there isn't a rubber rock glued to the hard shell is covered. All the other areas are covered with sculpt mold. So do you mix any color into that before you lay it down? No, because uh, uh, I cover everything as I showed with uh, white gesso to sort of give a starting, to, to produce a starting canvas for staining and painting. I just covered everything with this, this diluted uh, gesso co coating. I really like how thin some of that stuff is. You know, I don't think you could ever get a plaster rock that thin. Well, I don't either, uh, especially like that little canyon I showed you. Uh, and uh, as I already said, the painting I found really challenging. Um, I, I was just not able to get that India ink wash to, to do its trick. You know how, how well it can do on a plaster casting. It just, you touch a brush of it and the, the ink just flows everywhere. Uh, maybe there's something other than to use than gesso. I thought of even coating the rubber, rubber rock with a thin layer of plaster. Uh, I didn't know how well it would stick. It, it probably wouldn't. And then you're gonna obscure all the detail that you wanna preserve anyway. So I just went with the gesso, which doesn't really hide any detail, but maybe there's something other than that gesso that would take conventional stains better. Um, I did use washes of acrylics. I didn't use straight out of the bottle acrylics. So they're all thinned with water. So they, they are 
sort of stainy, stain-like. But uh, the painting was the toughest part. Hey, Rich, it's John. So when you were first evaluating what you wanted to do, did you look at the Bragdon, uh, the resin casting process that he has at all? Well, no, but uh, Jim Tardis, uh, uh, who used to come to our clinics uh, frequently, he gave a clinic, mm -hmm. I don't know, yeah. a few, several years ago when, when he did his layout with Bragdon's and they really turned out extremely well. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know how a side to side between Bragdon Rosin uh, and, and these rubber rocks would, would uh, compare. Um, uh, I think they would compare reasonably well, but they're certainly different in how you do them. Yep. Yeah, I used a little bit of that on uh, the little HON3 uh, module that I built and it worked out pretty well. Very, very light, a little different, obviously technique and how you would use it, but uh, very light is one of the things I liked about it. But yeah, very nice. I love the rubber, the look of the rubber molds came out great. Yeah, there's a, just take that, uh, that look here again of this. The detail is very, very good. It's very impressive. Painting is the toughest part. When you use the India ink, could you maybe use a spray bottle? Well, that that could be. You'd have to you'd have to spray it very directionally from one one angle. I'm not sure if you did it straight on. I'm not much of an airbrusher, but uh, you you'd cover everything. So um, I don't know. I I can't say. I've never tried it. But did you cover how you how you join up where two pieces of the uh, rubber rock come together? I didn't talk about that and. And the answer is you don't want to do it. I think I, I started out in the garage with a test piece of hard shell about three feet long before I made any serious errors on the layout. And I took two, two rubber rocks and I tried to butt them end to end. Well, you, you can't obviously match the, the patterns any more than you can with a, a, a mold. Here's an example, there's a joint here between but this is a very simple joint and it's just a butt joint. But uh, if you try to join a piece cut here with a piece cut here, uh, none of the outcroppings, uh, individual pieces would line up with each other. It looks terrible. I did try it on a test piece. It just didn't work. So you either want to make them continuous or you want to leave some space in between, uh, as I think most people do with molds. Thanks, Rich. You're welcome. That was uh, very interesting. I think I could see how those could be used with, uh, could become popular with modules and and uh, smaller areas. Well, I'm especially sure. yeah, especially modules because you're not too too worried about the cost. You're not going to be using you know hundreds of dollars worth of rocks on a single module. Yeah, and you might actually finish your scenery. <laughs> But this has been a presentation of the Pacific Northwest Region 4th Division NMRA group, the Skagit Valley and Whidbey Clinic. I'm Rich Blake, and our presentation was by Rich Tom today. And thanks, thanks to Rich for doing the presentation, and we will see you next week or next month.